quickly. Do you deserve Well, welcome to our continuing study of the Gospel of Luke. We are beginning chapter five today, as indicated on the screen there. Uh, we are in a position in Luke's Gospel where he has uh, taken us through in uh, the last chapter his announcement of his ministry there in his hometown of Nazareth, where he announced that he was the Messiah. And then quickly following that performs uh, the first miracle that we have recorded in Luke, and that of healing Peter's mother-in-law, uh, showing his authority over disease, over illness. As we move now into chapter 5, uh, we're going to see his authority over nature and also the calling of his first disciples. So uh, if you haven't gotten there yet, uh, we're in Luke chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. It says this, now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him, by the way, I should mention that in the interim, uh, it is, uh, it's been said that he uh, went throughout preaching in the synagogues of Judea, uh, but here in verse 1, uh, from the context that we see uh, coming later, we find that he's no longer in Judea, uh, he's back in Galilee, but he's not in Nazareth, he is in the city called Capernaum which is on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. So uh, that's our uh, geographical context. Uh, so the crowd was pressing around him. Uh, the word uh, pressing is a word that's uh, used, sometimes translated to lie upon, uh, to rest upon like a stone on tomb, uh, fish on the burning coals we find in John 21 after Jesus' resurrection. You remember that incident? And uh, it's used of a tempest in Acts, Acts 27, of the urgent demands for Christ's crucifixion in Luke 23. They were pressing upon uh, Pilate. And here it vividly pictures the eager, eager crowds around Jesus. They're, they're pressing upon him. They're, they're uh, overwhelming him in a sense physically. And, and notice why they're pressing upon him. This is remarkable, especially in light of what we saw in Nazareth. They're listening to the word of God. Isn't that something? All these people are pressing upon him, listening to the word of God. Now, this word, even listening, is something that uh, can be examined a little bit. It's a phrase taken from the Septuagint, uh, uh, where it's used oftentimes. And uh, Luke uses it uh, as well in his gospel. Uh, it only occurs once each, and the other Gospels, but Luke uses it uh, over and over again. As I think about uh, the crowds pressing upon Jesus, listening to the word of God, how I, how I wish that even those who claim to be God's people would so desire to hear the word of God taught. Uh, and then you look at the, the people that aren't even, don't even claim to be Christians, and, and they don't seem to want to hear uh, the word of God. Uh, we, we certainly have much to pray about concerning uh, people's response or, or desire, maybe I should say, for the word of God. And I'm so happy that you're here this morning because you do desire to hear the word of God. Yes. Bill, so what are they eager to hear? It's well, all this on media to hear what these so-called media stars and whatever they're doing, they follow them. They hang yeah. on their every word. But, and they have nothing to offer. That's right. Yeah. That's what's our eager to Yeah. Uh, any other comments? You know, we can take yeah. that in light of uh, the first verse in chapter four. It says, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That is the main function of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, the Holy Spirit was doing his job, preparing hearts, minds, bringing drawings, mm -hmm. and having people understand and seeking that word. So I thought that was a real interplay. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, the Holy Spirit is uh, directing Jesus and uh, ultimately is the one who draws people to hear. Uh, we see here that uh, Jesus was standing by the Lake of Gennesaret. Anybody know another name for the Lake of Gennesaret? Galilee. The Sea of Galilee. 
is what's called in the other gospels. Uh, <laughs> and and also um, it's called the Sea of Tiberias. But with characteristic accuracy, uh, Luke never calls it a sea. Now, if you understand what a sea is, you understand that usually a sea is somewhat equivalent to an ocean or a small ocean or part of an ocean. And if you know anything about the Sea of Galilee, you'll recognize immediately in its geography, it is not a sea. And yet, it, it had that name at the time, so we can't fault the gospel writers for calling it that. But Luke is correct in his designation and calling it a lake. For that's what it is. The Lake of Gennesaret. Um, Gennesaret was the town and plain on the northwest side of the lake, and it's from there that it receives that name. Uh, the lake itself is 13 miles approximately by 8 miles. So how does that compare to any lakes you've been on? Hmm? Not as big as Lake Erie. No. Um, is it as, I'm not sure what the size of other lakes around here, you know, are uh, pine tuning or um, mosquito. I don't know what size are those. I didn't think to look those up. Maybe Kinzu. About the size of Kinzu, you think? All right. Most of us, or many of us, probably have not been there to even compare that, but but ra rather a small lake compared to some, but but not tiny. And uh, the other thing that's notable about it is that it's 680 feet below sea level. Uh, so if you think about sea level, the Mediterranean Sea, and you come inland and you've got the mountains, and then you drop down into this uh, real gully, uh, 680 feet down then is the sea uh, or, or the, I should call it the Lake of Gennesaret. So Jesus is standing there as these crowds are pressing in on him. You know, you, you almost think about uh, an army that is has his back against the water. There's nowhere to go. Jesus is standing there. The crowds are pressing on him. There's nowhere to go except step into the water. But what happens? The next verse, he says, you saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. Now, one uh, source says that at any given time, there may have been 4,000 boats on the lake. Uh, Josephus says about 230 boats on the lake. So uh, somewhere, a lot of boats anyway, could be out there. And uh, the, the, the word lying here could indicate that they were anchored or simply they were drawn up on the beach. But they're, they're there. And we, and we see that the, the next phrase tells us why these boats are lying there un, unoccupied. It says, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing, <clears throat> excuse me, washing their nets. So fishermen, actually, the, literally, it's uh, sea, sea folk because um, the, the word fisherman has the word sea in it. Uh, Would you put a picture of that boat we saw in front of Oh, I forgot to go ahead on the... Yeah, I forgot. I have pictures. There's that cute cartoon. Uh -huh. All right. And uh, here's the Sea of Galilee uh, map. You can see where Capernaum is, which is the location of our present event. Gennesaret. Magdala is possibly where Mary Magdalene originated, although there's a lot of controversy over where that town may or may not be. You can see up to the north, Bethsaida, Tiberius, from which some get the name. And you can see, I think you can see from the, the map how the land is much higher around it. Uh, you can definitely see it in the pictures. <coughs> So it struck me most, I think, being on the Sea of Galilee is just how steep the sides are. You don't have sandy beaches, you know, just gradually going up. Do you have the pigs from there? That's not it. 
I, I, I was with the rain. When we were on the Sea of Galilee, I didn't know for sure where we were as far as the location of the pigs, but I can certainly see where the pigs were running down the sides here couldn't stop. You know, if you remember when you're a kid running down a steep hill and you, and you know you just can't stop, otherwise you fall and you just keep running faster and faster. Uh, that's the way it looks around there. You can see there's some cities presently there. And so there are many that have compared the Lake of Gennesaret to um, being in a cup. So they're very steep on the sides. And so when the wind blows, it blows very strong. The storms come up very quickly, which will come into play later on. Now, Jesus is going to tell them to go out into the deep. And uh, this is just a normal day. You can see it's uh, it's kind of rocky waves. And it's uh, very deep water. Uh, the next picture will show you just the normal windy, windiness. Now, that's not to say there aren't some areas that are not so steep. Uh, this was a, a beach area on the Sea of Galilee that we were able to go into in the evening. So it says here that the fishermen were washing their nets. What? Wait a minute. Nets have been in water all day long. Why would you need to wash them? For the uh, weeds. Weeds that got caught in them. Well, nets are like a tool. It's like when I used to cook, I got knives. Why would you sharpen knives? Why would you? Same thing. They got to be repaired. They got tore. They had to be washed. Yeah. So that was a very essential part of their life. It would be dirty, even from sand, uh, pebbles caught in them. So it, it, it take, took some. Uh, repair to get them in shape for the next time they would be used. Uh, and fishing was a very profitable trade in that area. Uh, this lake provided a lot of fish, not only for the population of Galilee, but they would export it to uh, Judea as well. Uh, men like Simon, his brother Andrew, and their partners John and James appear to be prosperous businessmen. You probably don't usually think of them that way. We, probably most of us have in mind some dirty, stinking fishermen who go out there and they're they're poor and they barely catch enough to, to live on. But uh, these guys are in business. Uh, so much so that they employ workers to assist them. So as we'll see later, when they, they leave their business, their business doesn't stop because they've got people working. So it seems that uh, these fishermen, though, as we see, uh, the fishermen had gotten out of the boats or washing their nets. That means they're not doing what? They're not, well, they're not fishing, but what else are they not doing in the context of what's occurring here? Listening. Because all these people are pressing on Jesus, and these guys are off washing their nets, uh, seemingly disinterested. Um, or or could they hear from where they were and say, well, we might as well, you know, listen to a podcast while we're washing our nets. That could be. And it wasn't they didn't know Jesus. So we know from the other Gospels that they had actually been called by Jesus uh, earlier. Prior to this, they uh, had been acquainted with him from John the Baptist on. So uh, verse 3 it says that Jesus, seeing these two boats anchored there, got into one of them. And it just happened to be Simon's boat. Now, we have an idea of what these boats look like. And this drawing actually is pretty close. Uh, here's a, an actual 2,000-year-old boat that was found in the mud of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it's not entirely intact, but uh, they can tell a lot from this. And so they've been able to rebuild a model 
of it. And uh, that's probably your typical fishing boat in the Sea of Galilee. It would have been much like uh, Simon had and, and uh, much like the boat into which Jesus climbed. It was small. It was small, but big enough that uh, you could have, you know, a number of men on on that boat. Uh, they were between 27 around 27 to 30 feet long and about uh, seven and a half feet wide. Uh, this boat was discovered in 1986, the one that was. This room there. is just a little over 30 feet wide. Yeah. So the picture, it's not, it's not a small room. Yeah. 27 to 30 It's feet. not a canoe. Yeah. It's, it's a, not a ship, yeah. but it's, it's big enough that yeah. a number of men could be in it and a lot of fish could be in it. Uh, so he got in one of the boats and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. Why did he sit down? That's what they did back then. The teacher sat up. Teacher sat. There's another good reason. So they don't fall out of the boat. <laughs> Gravity. Right? Gravity. <laughs> Gravity. Yeah. yeah. Jim, from curiosity, my boat, the sailboat that I had, was 37 and a half feet long, and it had a lot of volume in it. Those boats could actually hold a lot of fish. Yeah. They, they look small in the pictures, but they could actually hold quite a bit. <laughs> That's a good point, and uh, we'll come back to that. All right, so he sat down, and uh, as uh, one commentator says, the Christ uses Peter's boat as a pulpit once to throw the net of the gospel over his hearers. I thought that was a nice turn of phrase. Uh, so here's, an, here's another picture of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this looks like it's in the, uh, maybe the northeastern part. And just, just for your enjoyment, here's one toward evening. Verse 4, when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, who, who is the owner of the boat, the, the boss of the operation, he speaks to him. And as I said before, this is not the first time Jesus had spoken with Simon, his brother Andrew, and his partner James and John. Uh, they had had conversations with him before, if you check out, especially the Gospel of John talks about those. But it had, they had not yet been called to constantly be with him. They've been called to follow him in, in a sense of, of recognizing him as Messiah, but we're going to see where he's going to have a, a more permanent calling on them in a little while. And he says to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, this word let down is a word used by Luke that was also, surprise, a common medical term to denote relaxation of the limbs. Relax. Relax your nets kind of idea. The loosening of bandages, uh, the abatement of sickness, of letting herbs down into a vessel to be steeped. And it gives us the purpose of the letting down of the nets. He doesn't just say... Hey, let's try it one more time. Let's go out and see what happens. He says the purpose is for them to get a catch. And uh, that's the startling thing that stirred up Simon. If Jesus simply wanted a demonstration, show me how you do it there, Peter. That would be understandable to a degree. But he thinks that he can tell professional fishermen where and when to catch fish. Someone has said, uh, Jesus did not make a suggestion. He made a command. And he did not order the disciples to let down their nets to try to catch fish. He ordered them to put out their nets for a catch of fish. In other words, Jesus was issuing both a command and a promise. The command was to put out the nets. The promise was that there would be a catch. And what a catch it would be. 
Now the net, no, I'll we'll talk about the net later. Um, verse five, Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. The word master here is not the word rabbi that we find in other gospels. Uh, it's not even Lord. It is a word that's only used by Luke in the New Testament. And it's always used to address Christ. Uh, it's common in older writers for a superintendent or an overseer, one standing over another. And, and of course, this recognizes Christ's authority. Uh, why would Luke never use the word rabbi? Anybody? I mean, it would be a strike of lightning if anybody would think of that, I think. Why would he not use rabbi? Think of his audience. Greek. Yeah. And rabbi is? Hebrew. Hebrew, yeah. So if he used the word rabbi here, his Greek audience wouldn't have any idea what he was talking about. Luke was a Gentile on top of it. And, he, and Luke was a Gentile. Yeah, so he uses Gentile language here, uh, language of an understand. Now, so he, he says, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. Can you sense the tension there? Think about it. They've been working all night. And Jesus says, go out and go, you know, go do it again. Yeah, and I can, in my mind, I can imagine that because of the fact that when they fished, they fished at night. They didn't normally fish during the daytime. Yeah, why was that? They fished, I, I don't know whether it was too warm or what, but the fish did not respond. So they fished at night. And I saw that when I was living in Florida where they didn't want to stuff at night mm -hmm. after dark. Yeah, during the hottest part of the day, the fish do not stay up near the surface because it's hot. They dive deeper into the cooler water. Uh, you might find some fish stuck in shallow water, but you'd never find fish in deeper water because they've gone deeper than you can put, get your nets. Uh, the word here can be applied to either a casting net, such as in Ma Matthew 4.18, which is just a, a small net that you cast in shallow water, or to a drag net or sweep net, as in Matthew 13, 47. This word can be used in both. There's specific words for those two kinds of nets, and this word can cover any of them. So we, we don't know from the word itself what kind of net it was, but we know by what happened, what kind of net it was, that it was a drag net. I could not find a picture, a good picture of a drag net. Um, this is the closest I could come. Only this is more of the, uh, the casting net but picture it much bigger. <laughs> it's huge. And they, they cast it out there into the, the water. Uh, they're going out in deep water. And so I think it's the drag net that's in view. Uh, the following remarks of uh, Dr. Thompson, who wrote a book called The Land and the Book, uh, gives us a good illustration of this passage. After describing the mode of fishing with the hand net and the drag net, he has this. Again, there is the bag net and basket net of various kinds, which are so constructed and worked as to enclose the fish out in deep water. I have seen them of almost every conceivable size and pattern. It was with someone of this sort, I suppose, that Simon had toiled all night without catching anything, but which, when let down at the command of Jesus, enclosed so great a multitude that the net broke, and they filled two ships with the fish until they began to sink. Peter here speaks of toiling all night, and there are certain kinds of fishing always carried on at night. It is a beautiful sight. With blazing torch, the boat glides over the flashing sea, and the men stand gazing keenly into it until their prey is sighted, when quick as lightning they fling their net or fly their spear. And often you see the tired fishermen come sullenly into harbor in the morning, having toiled all night in vain. Indeed, every kind of fishing is uncertain. A dozen times the angler jerks out a naked hook, the hand net closes down on nothing, and the drag net brings in only weeds. The bag comes up empty. And then again, every throw is successful, every net is full, and frequently without any other apparent reason than that of throwing it on the right side of the ship instead of the left, as it happened to the disciples 
here at Tiberius. So Peter is rather taken aback by this command to do something which goes against every bit of knowledge he has about fishing. He said, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. Can you imagine if I was visiting Frank and find that he'd been dealing with a computer problem all night, couldn't come up with a solution, and I promptly suggested he simply reboot? How would you feel about that, Frank? <laughs> would, you, totally the same way. would you feel like hitting me? Like, well, I did that all night, but I'll do it again. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. <laughs> You'd say, get out of here. <laughs> you said, yeah, we'll do it again. <laughs> I went down to John's farm and uh, he'd been dealing with some kind of insect infestation. And I said, well, John, why don't you just, you know, go spray raid? <laughs> Already done that, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you can see what kind of uh, what kind of event we have here. Of, of what uh, Simon is dealing with. What might he have said? He might have said, I worked all night and I'm tired. He might have said, I know a lot more about fishing than some carpenter. <laughs> he might have said, the best fishing is at night, not in the daytime. Don't you know that? He might have said, all these crowds and log teaching has scared the fish away. He might have said, we already washed our nets and we'll have to do it all over again. He might have said, Jesus may know religion, but he doesn't know fishing. But he didn't say any of those things. He said, I will do as you say, and let down the nets. Now, I, I don't know what he was thinking as he said that. Uh, was he hopeful that what Jesus said would actually happen? Was he just giving in to a person that he recognized as superior? I think I he's just desperate, willing to try it. I'll try anything. I've done, I've done all that I can do. I'll, I'll try this one time to do what somebody else is requesting. I think mostly it's out of obedience, just obeying what Jesus said. It's sort of a word for that, isn't there, Bill? Isn't that called faith? Yeah. Well, and, and I, I would say, yeah, trust, faith, but um, whether he expected that there would be a great catch or not, I'm not sure is as, as relevant as simply the obedience. Because sometimes we need to just obey. I think by his response, he didn't expect it. Yeah. At all. I think it is. I think you're right. This is simple obedience. Jesus said it. That's good enough for me. I'll go to And is that, again, coming right back to faith? Is not faith? When we do stuff and we really sometimes don't even expect it to even work out. But God, you said, don't commit adultery, so I'm not going to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Jesus may not know fishing, humanly speaking, but he knows how to get the fish where he wants them to go. And when they've done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish. <laughs> R.C. Sproul points out that there was hesitancy on the part of Peter, but no hesitancy on the part of the fish. They had such a great quantity of fish that their nets began to break, began to tear in two, literally. And if they if they did break, they would lose all the fish. So verse seven, they signaled that Simon and whoever else was in the boat, his employees, <clears throat> signal to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. Now, what happened a lot of times with these large nets is you would cast them out and there would be two boats, one on each end of the net to, to bring it in. And so they're calling for their partners to come out. Now, why did they signal? Well, maybe they were too far away to, to call, but you also know that if you're on the water, sometimes the, the noise of the of the water, certainly the noise of the crowds might have made it difficult for anyone to hear them. Um, no because, cell phones. And no cell phones. Yeah. And no signal, probably, anyway. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Too low. So they called out for their partners. 
this word is actually something that indicates uh, partners in business. Um, and it means they participate in the same employment, uh, Godet says. And they came and filled both of the boats. Now, again, these are a little less than 30 foot long boats, and they're both are filled with fish. And I don't know how, I mean, remember the picture that we have of the boat, um, deep enough that, that that's a lot of fish. There's one artist's rendering of it. And here's a, another one of the, of the two boats working together uh, to bring in all those fish. So much so they began to sink. So much weight in the boats that the water is getting close to the edge of the boat and starting to come in. Now, that's a lot of weight. Jim, how, how much weight would it take for your boat to be taken down into the water that much? What it was, I, think, I think it displaced something like, uh, I think it was over 8,000 pounds. Um, so these are big fish. They're heavy fish. There's a lot of them. Next verse. But when Simon Peter saw that, when he saw the so many fish that our boats are sinking, what did he do? The dollar signs are going through his head, right? No, that's not his thoughts. He fell down at Jesus's feet. Actually, it's literally knees. He fell at his knees. And, and I'm thinking in the middle of the fish, I mean, there's no room. <laughs> He's got to. He's got to be falling down in the fish at Jesus' knees. And uh, someone has said here only in his gospel, Luke uses the compound name Simon Peter. Did you know? It says Simon Peter, not just Simon. He's not been called Peter yet. So this is kind of looking, it's sort, of, sort of an anachronistic name, looking back at Simon Peter. Uh, he, he's always called Simon before this. Uh, afterwards, except in passages where he is quoting other people, Luke always calls him Peter. And this another person says, I believe that Luke is signaling the reader to the greater role which Peter is beginning to play as a result of his confession and praise. And what does Simon Peter say as he's falling at Jesus' knees? Go away from me, Lord. Changes from master to to Lord, why? For I am a sinful man. Uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee uh, wrote a book on this, and he was talking about there were three separate and distinct calls to the apostles, but they would uh, they would kind of go for a while, and then they would fall off. Mm -hmm. and, but, but he said there, the final call was the call to apostleship. It was recorded in Mark 3, Matthew 10, Luke 6 where they had gone back to fishing, and Simon Peter said to him, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, oh Lord, somebody else. Uh, what he was really saying, why don't you go get somebody else? Let me alone, because I have failed you so. I am a sinful man. But the Lord didn't give him back, give him, give him up. Thank God for that. So the Lord came to him the third time and appointed him to apostleship. So apparently there were, there were other distinctive calls made upon their lives and they 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 didn't follow through with it yeah as i said i think the, the previous calls were calls to follow him in, in a sense of recognizing him as messiah not necessarily full-time um the call that's going to come to them now is a full-time occupation is a is a life commitment now, one might have expected Peter here, seeing this great catch of fish, to begin thinking of some kind of a business proposition. You know, you think that Peter would have said to Jesus, uh, look, Jesus, I'll go 50, as high as 50%. You just come out once a week and do this, and we'll both make a lot of money. But he doesn't think that way at all. Instead, he begs Jesus to leave. It was just like Peter to go from this extreme self-confidence and pride to abject humility. But his impulse here was right and sincere. His confession was true. He was a sinful man. 
R.C. Sproul comments, do you know why our churches aren't filled right now? Because there are hundreds of thousands of people who want to stay as far away from Jesus as they possibly can. The reason they want to avoid the worship of Jesus and his presence is the same reason Peter gave to Jesus. Sinners don't want to come to church because they're sinners. And nothing makes a sinner more uncomfortable than to be in the presence of a holy God. We've already seen the response of the demons to Jesus. Jesus, please leave. Why are you tormenting us here before the time? The demons couldn't stand to be in the presence of the holy, and neither can sinners. He continues. Without the cross, people are without hope in this world. But the cross is not just a sign of hope. It's also a sign of guilt. Because when we see that cross, we know that it represents the work of Christ who saves his people who were in sin. Just as a vampire in the movies shrinks in horror at the sign of the cross, so a fallen human creature shrinks in horror at the sign of Christ, because Christ is holy and we are not. People who are unholy are always uncomfortable in the presence of the holy. Now, what did Peter mean by kneeling before Jesus and calling him Lord? It's obvious submission to him. Uh, was it worship to Jesus as the incarnate Son of God, the Messiah? Could be. And seeing what Jesus had done, he, he could have come to that recognition. Not, not sure what's in his mind. That certainly is a possibility. And then calling himself a sinful man. What caused Simon to recognize his sin at this moment? And what was he confessing his sin? Well, just as Archie Sproul was saying, uh, the closer we get to God, the more we recognize our own sinfulness. E.W. Bullinger points out, true conviction has regard to what one is, not to what one has done. Guess that? True conviction has regard to what one is, not to what one has done. And we can compare uh, some different uh, people in the Old Testament that have confessed similar things. Let's look up a couple of these. Uh, maybe I'll, we'll, we'll kind of scatter them out. Uh, will someone take Judges 13.22? Judges 13.22. Frank, um, okay, Judges was not to your liking. How about Exodus? <laughs> Exodus 2019, Barb? 1 Samuel 6.20. 1 Samuel 6.20. 2 Samuel 12.13. 2 Samuel. Do give me 2 Samuel. Give me 2 Samuel. Anybody give me 2 Samuel? <laughs> Samuel going once. Second Samuel 12 13. 12 13. Uh Job. We'll take Job. Who's willing to get a job? <laughs> no Job's? All right. We'll come back to him. How about Isaiah? Is that anybody's liking Isaiah? What was the Job one? Job uh, 40, verse 4. Got it. And 42, 2 to 6. Okay, how about Isaiah? Well, this is the best of all. I, all right, do Isaiah 6, 5. All right, first, uh, we've got Manoah, Judges 13, 22. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. All right, and Manoah, anybody know who Manoah was? I hear some whispering. Nobody? Uh, the father of uh, <laughs> Samson. Father of Samson. Oh, I almost said Sam, uh, Samuel and Solomon and uh, Samson. And so he said, we've seen God. We're going to die. Because to be in the presence of God is not a healthy thing. Okay, how about uh, of Israel, Exodus 20, 19. I'm at it just 
with another one. So I'm right there. Okay. Did somebody have Exodus? Yeah, I think that's the one you gave me. Oh, okay. That's that's why you're there then. Okay. You're confusing me, Barb. <laughs> okay, read Exodus 20, 19. It starts in the middle of a sentence. It's when... Uh, you can back up if you want. Yes, it's 18. Now, this is the giving of the law. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flash of the lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off. Right, this is 19. And said to Moses, you speak to us, and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Saying, we, we don't want to listen to God because he's too holy. We'll die if we listen to him. You, you've got to be our mediator. Uh, the, the men of Beth Shemesh, 1 Samuel 6.20. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall it go up from us? Yeah, who is able to stand? Uh, David in 2 Samuel 12, 13. Uh, and David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also has put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. All right, David recognizing his sin before the Lord. Uh, Job, first in uh, 40, verse 4. Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. And this is after chapter 40. He's already gone through all the stuff we know about Job. And uh, finally, God appears and uh, talks to him. And what does Job say? My hand's over my mouth. All the complaining I've done, all what I've said before, I, I stop. That's it. Okay, 42, 2 to 6. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I do not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak, and I will ask you, and you will instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I retract, and I repent in dust and ashes. Seeing God has a tendency to make you feel like you need to repent. And you do. <laughs> and, and my favorite of all, Isaiah 6 5. This is in Isaiah's vision of the Lord. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Woe is me, because I've seen the Lord. That's the proper response. Uh, Dallas Seminary professor Daryl Box says this, Luke does not use the term pejoratively, the term sinner, but compassionately as a common term applied to those who were isolated from Jewish religious circles because of their open sin, their unacceptable occupation or lifestyle or their paganism. Luke shows that these sinners are the object of God's grace through the ministry of Jesus. And so the response of Peter and the response of anyone who understands who Jesus is, is this, I'm not worthy. And so Peter says, go away from me. What Peter doesn't realize is that admitting his inability and sin is the best prerequisite for service, not to send him away because then you can depend on god before that you're depending on yourself as peter had done even in his fishing peter's confession becomes his resume for service uh, that that ought to be the first question maybe asked on on any interviewee for a, a church position anywhere is do you recognize your sin Humility is the elevator to spiritual greatness, someone said. What Simon needed most was not to have Jesus leave. What he needed most was a Savior. And we'll pick up with what happens next, next week.
Any final comments or questions? Don't forget about uh, tonight. We're looking at the medieval times, specifically at the sacramental system. We'll spend some time there and some other areas as well. We'll get a greater understanding of that whole uh, system of the Roman Catholic Church. Anybody else? Bill, yeah. Uh, no, I'm not I, I, I've been reading through this commentary over and over and over again while we've been talking about this, so I have to read these. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Peter knew that Jesus has healed the sick and driven out demons, but he was but he was amazed that Jesus cared cared about his day-to-day -day routine and understood his needs. God is interested not only in saving us, but also in helping us in our daily activities. Mm -hmm. He is Lord over all. Exactly. Even that. Yeah. Good. All right. Thank you, Lord, that uh, from this incident in the life of Jesus and Simon, that there are many things that we can learn that you can apply to our life. We pray that you would do that by your Holy Spirit, that this would re remain with us throughout the week and, uh, and encourage us as we share the good news with others. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.